Hello and welcome. I want to thank everybody for joining our ASPPH Presents webinar, Public Health Careers. Uh, my name is Eyal Oren. I'm the Interim Director at San Diego State University School of Public Health, and I'm delighted to be here today uh, to moderate our session. We have a very esteemed panel um, who I will introduce shortly. Uh, first, uh, again, I want to welcome you all and let you know that the field of public health is one that allows individuals and uh, professionals to positively impact the health of people around the world in many, many different ways. With so many different options, it can be overwhelming to figure out how we all fit in. Uh, but uh, because of that, and because there's no single career trajectory, there are also a multitude of different opportunities and today's speakers will provide a high level overview of the different career types that are available, provide insight into their unique career paths, and we hope will inspire your next steps in this very important and timely field. We encourage you to enter your questions at any point during our webinar by clicking on the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. We will have the Q&A session directly after the speaker presentations. This webinar will be recorded and will be available online shortly after we conclude the session today. So it's now my honor to introduce our speakers uh, in order of Zoom appearance. Um, and again, really uh, amazing people with very diverse backgrounds. So I'll start uh, with our first presenter, uh, Jeff Oxendine. Uh, Jeff is the founder and CEO of Health Career Connection a national nonprofit that inspires and empowers the next generation of diverse health leaders and professionals. He has been a health executive, educator, and consultant for over 30 years. Jeff started out as a hospital administrator and medical group executive and changed paths to become a faculty member in health policy and management, associate dean of public health practice, and co-director of the undergraduate major at UC Berkeley School of Public Health. He is a health workforce and diversity consultant and recently served as co-director of the California, California Future Health Workforce Commission and currently serves as co-director of the California Health Professions Consortium. He is the author of the newly released book, You Don't Have to Be a Doctor, Discover, Achieve, and Enjoy Your Authentic Health Career. Following Jeff, Denise Fair uh, will present. Denise serves as the Chief Public Health Officer for the Detroit Health Department, appointed by Mayor Mike Duggan. In this role, she directs public health strategies toward protecting the health and well-being of residents, including vulnerable populations such as seniors and the homeless, from communicable diseases and health threats like COVID-19. Denise leads a team of more than 250 public health experts who also support the economic viability of the city by offering public health guidance for the safe operation of businesses, churches, and educational institutions throughout Detroit. Prior to leading Detroit's health department, Denise served as a group practice director at Henry Ford Health System, providing executive oversight for primary care clinics and multi-specialty medical centers. Prior to that, she served as a senior consultant and program administrator for Trinity Health System managing a broad portfolio of operations, including ambulatory clinics and urgent care facilities. She holds positions in the Detroit Authority and the Detroit URC Board of Directors. She has served as part of the Executive Committee for the Livonia Chamber of Commerce and the Michigan Chapter of the American College of Healthcare Executives Board of the Directors. She obtained a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor, a Master of Public Health from the University of California at Berkeley, and earned her Master of Business Administration from the Mike Illich School of Business at Wayne State University. She's also board certified in healthcare management from the American College of Healthcare Executives. Following Denise, we will have Dr. Nicole Cooper. Dr. Cooper currently serves as head of healthcare policy at Lyft. In this role, she develops and manages Lyft's national healthcare policy agenda while expanding Lyft's presence in the healthcare sector. Since 2016, Lyft has worked with healthcare organizations across the country to help communities in need, including low-income individuals, the elderly, and people with disabilities. Travel to health services such as dialysis treatment, chemotherapy, and prenatal care. 
Dr. Cooper previously served as Vice President of Corporate Social Responsibility at United Healthcare, where she led national signature partnerships and local and state social investment strategies to bolster UHC's social impact across the US. Reporting to the United Healthcare Chief Communications Officer, among other responsibilities, Dr. Cooper spearheaded national corporate philanthropic grant making efforts and employee volunteerism programs that were focused on addressing basic access to care and the social determinants of health for underserved communities. She was also a member of the Executive United Healthcare Culture, Inclusion, and Diversity Council. Prior to joining United Healthcare, Dr. Cooper was an Obama administration political appointee and part of the US Department of Health and Human Services team responsible for implementation of the Affordable Care Act. At HHS, Dr. Cooper served as a policy advisor to key leaders in the agency, including the chief of staff at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Minority Health. She holds a bachelor's degree from Spelman College, a Master of Public Health degree from the University of Michigan, and a Doctor of Public Health, DRPH degree from Harvard University. Following Dr. Cooper, Lesford Duncan uh, will present. Mr. Duncan is the Senior Director of Programs at Outdoor Outreach. Since 1999, Outdoor Outreach has helped over 14,000 youth explore their world challenge themselves and discover what they're capable of, using the outdoors as a platform for youth development and resilience. Lesford has a career background in developing programs, partnerships, and policies that enhance the health and resilience of children and families. Prior to joining Outdoor Outreach, he worked in child welfare, cultural competency, and behavioral health for the County of San Bernardino, California. There, he educated on the effects of adverse childhood experiences, known as ACEs, developed trauma-informed programs for building resilience in children and youth, and developed strategies for increasing diversity, equity, and inclusion in county health and human services. Lesford received his BS in biology from the University of Florida and MPH in health policy and leadership from Loma Linda University. He's also a senior fellow with the Atlantic Fellows for Health Equity, ultra marathon runner, and avid hiker and outdoorsman. Next, we will have Justine Kozo. Ms. Kozo has served as the Office of Border Health Chief for the County of San Diego Health and Human Services Agency, where she facilitates collaborative activities among organizations working in the California, Baja California border region. In her role, she participates on numerous projects ranging from emergency preparedness to mental health. The most important aspect of her job is building trusting and strategic partnerships with leadership in San Diego and Tijuana in order to facilitate cross-border collaboration. She's also an adjunct assistant professor at San Diego State University, where she teaches a course on motivating health behavior. Prior to working for the County of San Diego, Ms. Coza worked at UC San Diego and San Diego State University for eight years in various public health roles, including managing community-based binational HIV research studies. She earned her master's degree in public health with an emphasis in health promotion from San Diego State University in 2006. Ms. Coza has co-authored several manuscripts addressing topics including HIV research in the San, Di San Diego, Tijuana border region, emergency preparedness, and binational US-Mexico health in general. Finally, I want to introduce Ms. Letitia Cazares. Raised by civil rights leaders in Chula Vista, a few miles from the Tijuana-Mexico border in Tijuana, Letitia grew up learning the unique history of the binational region that has inspired over 20 years of work to eliminate health and social inequities for Latinx and other minority peoples. Prior to her current role as lecturer and internship coordinator for the San Diego State University School of Public Health, she was a practitioner in community health, implementing the Affordable Care Act for one of the largest federally qualified health centers, FQHCs, in San Diego. She has held a range of public health roles from entry level to senior management. In addition, she has a background in government as a legislative assistant for a member of the US House of Representatives. She's currently president of the board for the American Civil, Civil Liberties Union, ACLU, in San Diego, and was recently elected into office as a trustee of Southwestern Community College District. As a recent breast cancer survivor, she was exposed to the inequities in the healthcare system and now is more than ever committed to advancing social, economic, and health justice by amplifying community voices and cultivating personal power. Creating equitable and inclusive systems and building a pipeline of compassionate progressive leaders, she holds a BA in psychology from San Francisco State University and a master's in public health from San Diego State University. So with that, I'm gonna open it to our panelists and I'm going to invite Jeff uh, to begin. 
Happy Friday, everyone, and thanks so much for joining this, uh, this webinar. Um, I'm going to talk about, the next slide, please, Tracy. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, your, uh, the broad range of public health career options and how you uh, can discover and achieve your authentic health career, and then what, can you, what you can do now um, to begin advancing um, towards your public health career goals. I'm going to start by talking about why public health, and as I, all of us know right now, is public health is more important than ever. It's always been important, but it's in this we're in the spotlight dealing with our our multiple pandemics um, at this point in time with COVID-19, with uh, the economic crisis, and with systemic racism. And that public health is, you know, our health needs are great right now uh, with the pandemic, but also even prior to that, the pandemic has magnified the underlying inequities. Um, that have resulted in disparities in health status in our population and the, and the devastating impact of COVID-19 on, on underserved and communities of color. Um, we have huge uh, public health needs. Um, most things, as you know, are most of the things that are impacting us are preventable. And there's a tremendous opportunity for all of you in public health to, do, to go upstream um, and to uh, have more impact on prevention and building healthier communities and giving people the opportunities to have um, good health. And uh, public health is about social justice. Um, and it's a, and those of you who are interested in being a clinician, being able to pursue public health will make you a more effective clinician because basically we have to serve people within the context that they live um, and in the communities that they live and focus on prevention as well as good care. And public health is an area, don't let anybody tell you that you can't um, make money in public health. It's an area where you can do well by doing good. The next slide, please. So I know many of you are passionate about public health because of all those whys and other reasons. And the questions I get um, from students for the last 20 years is, I'm passionate about public health, but what can I do with a public health degree? So I'm now going to talk about some of the, the broad health career op public health options and then drill down into what happens within these particular paths and then even particular jobs that you can uh, pursue. So public health is, is very multidisciplinary. There's something in it for everyone. Uh, the key is to align, find what your passion is, align with um, what the roles are in these different categories. And these are different public health career paths. They also correspond to graduate education paths within, within public health. So we're now gonna drill down into to many of these paths to talk about what folks do. Next slide, please. Um, and these are sectors that public health professionals work in. And oftentimes people think about governmental public health as the, the first place that you think about public health being practiced. And that's really the front lines. And we're grateful for the public health heroes right now that are uh, mitigating uh, COVID-19. Um, but in addition to governmental public health, um, you can work in a wide range of settings. And your job is to get exposed to what these settings are. There is increasing amounts of public health in hospitals and health systems. You can work in health centers and at the intersection of primary care and public health. A lot happening in, in private sector now with public health. And you'll hear from Nicole Cooper talking about the exciting work she's doing at Lyft. And of course, there's working in academia or global health. So these are all sectors um, and encourage you to look at your, your interest in public health across these different sectors. The next slide, please. Within these sectors, I'm now gonna talk about different career paths um, in different public health disciplines. And the first is in, is in health management. And that's the area that I'm um, pursued. I have an MBA and a master in public health and um, started out as a hospital administrator. Within health management, um, you can focus on these different areas. You can be a general management person who becomes um, someone who manages the operations of, of the organization and also deals with the strategy, deals with the, the community, um, basically all the things that are involved in leading a health organization, which is a very exciting role, a very challenging uh, role. Or you can specialize in, in the multitude of areas here, ranging from things like health IT, which are having increasing prominence to finance to contracting strategy, um, also emerging career paths within community benefit, um, really assessing the need of the community and making sure nonprofit institutions are meeting those needs and even greater needs now around diversity, equity, inclusion. So these are all roles that you could pursue um, within health management. Next slide, please. 
I often hear people talk about being interested in health policy. And then when I ask them, well, what do you want to do with health policy? They say, well, I, I want to work on health policy. And I say, okay, well, you've got to drill down a little bit to be more clear. What aspects of, of health policy do you want to work on? <clears throat> and so there's a range of health policy from identifying what the needs are and, and then developing policies to respond to that, organizing people to um, to advocate for policies and to tell uh, to work with legislators, um, being able to do research on the impact of policy, um, to inform decision making, or being in the the, the process of developing um, and and making policy or implementing policy through regulatory um, and policy implementation. So, um, helpful for you to think about what paths you want to pursue in health policy. Next slide, please. I also find that people in community health sometimes are, have, have a challenge saying, well, I'm really passionate about health equity. I'm really passionate about improving the health of, of communities, um, but what do I do with my public health degree in community health? And so these are the types of things that uh, people with a community health degree, uh, specialization within public health might focus on, focus on from assessing what the community's needs are all the way to developing the interventions, getting the, writing the grants, implementing the program, evaluating programs, and then ongoing advocacy for populations and also for policy change. So these are some examples in community health. The next slide is about technology is in the spotlight right now by being able to um, um, report on the distribution of COVID-19 you know, across our, our population. And so people in epidemiology can work in governmental public health um, with surveillance, with investigation, tracking and reporting. But epidemiology is also increasingly part of health systems. It's increasingly part of the private sector. It's always been a big part of global health and, and academic research. But so these are different paths that you can pursue if you're interested in epidemiology. The next slide is about infectious disease. And uh, infectious disease also right now, uh, given what's going on, is right in the spotlight. And there are more and more opportunities to engage in, in research and analysis in developing the policies and procedures of how we're responding you know, to, the, to the pandemic. Um, but infectious disease is not new. It's been around for a long time dealing with HIV and AIDS and, and other kinds of uh, infectious illnesses. You can work in infection control. You can be a clinician that provides care with infectious disease. And obviously in our private industry now developing vaccines. So these are all paths within infectious disease. And then many of you are probably interested in becoming some kind of a clinician, either a physician um, or a nurse practitioner or PA or or an RN, a pharmacist, and combining that with public health. And we need you if that's what you want to do. There's a lot of ways you can combine public health and medicine. This is my good colleague and friend, Dr. Muntu Davis, who's the uh, health officer for LA County with an MD and MPH. Um, and you can be a public health officer, uh, but there are other things that you can do as well um, within, you can be a leader within health systems or in a, in a community health center that is a medical director in addition to providing care. You can be a researcher, you can be in academia and, and teach and provide care as well as research, or you can just be a more effective clinician. Um, as mentioned earlier, I think we're really gonna be, healthcare is gonna be delivered with more and more of a public health lens going forward. So those of you interested in, in clinical care, please also get that MPH. Next slide, please. And across all those different career paths, we need people who are gonna be committed to and skilled at focusing on the social determinants of health. And right now, our situation with COVID is magnifying the critical need um, to, to make sure people have affordable housing, um, to make sure econo economic development and employment are huge parts of, of our public health recovery right now. And of, we, as we know of, of empowering people to have the health uh, and the opportunity that they need. Our education is gonna be struggling right now um, in order to be able to um, uh, uh, deal with the pandemic um, situation. And we have um, transportation and other things. So these are all areas where we have to build power for people within our communities as well to do this work. So these are all areas across public health where people need to work. Next slide, please. COVID-19 has impacted public health career opportunities in a significant way. Um, we have um, these type of roles are increasing with contact tracing and telehealth and behavioral health 
uh, needs and hopefully more focus on public health infrastructure. So as you're looking at things, these are roles that are growing right now and I think will continue to grow going forward. Next slide, please. Um, and it, one thing is that there, you may start out in a certain path and then you'll navigate and combine and change your paths as your life and as the world changes. My own path, I start out as a hospital administrator. Um, I became a medical group administrator because an opportunity presented itself to do that. I enjoyed the more entrepreneurial nature of that. Along the way, I founded a nonprofit because of my passion for empowering students and increasing diversity in the health professions. Um, I um, then decided to pivot to be an associate dean and work in the School of Public Health and teach for many years. I have always done consulting um, on the side and uh, continue to do that in health workforce and diversity. Um, and now wrote, written a book and a coach. So, it, and as my life changes, you know, as I had children, as I was at different stages of my life, I did different kinds of things. So that's the beauty of public health. There's so many different options. If you follow your passion and your heart, you'll be able to, and the opportunities, you'll be able to navigate a path that works for you. The next slide, please. So I'm gonna drill down now into some opportunities for um, students in, uh, that have a BA. You know, some of you are, may have an MPH. Some of these things will still work, but I often find that students are asking me, okay, well, that's great. I see what I can do broadly, but, but where do I get my opportunities? How do I get specific jobs? So these are specific job opportunities within public health. On the left, the, these are the type of organizations that, that hire people commonly out of undergrad as well as out of graduate school. Um, and, but there also are many different types of programs available, um, like the CDC Associates Program. And one of my HCC students yesterday got hired for the Capital Health Fellows Program in Sacramento to work in health policy. So these are different types of, of organizations and programs that you can be part of. And the time is to look now because in consulting firms, the electronic health record companies, others are beginning to recruit right now on your campuses. So please, please check them out. The next slide, please. Um, what are job titles that people with undergraduate degrees and in many cases graduate degrees go to as well. So these are the different types of job titles to look for. I found with undergraduate students, there's a lot focused on being an analyst, uh, being an assistant. There's a lot of population health coordinator roles right now, um, quality improvement analysts, uh, research assistants, a lot of project manager roles. Um, on the clinical side, there's health coaches and health navigators, there's scribes, um, and there's becoming a medical assistant on your way to becoming a, a medical professional of some kind. And there's a lot happening in technology right now and in startups. So these are different kind of roles that you might look at. Next slide, please. Um, these are the different types of employers who hire undergraduates. I think we talked about this earlier, so we'll go on to the next slide. What are employers looking for? So it's important to understand that um, if those are the type of roles, and this is something I'm hearing across different sectors from public health to community health centers to um, health systems to academia, that people are looking for these type of skills. And the good news is many of you are developing this from your public health undergraduate program. I would say that analytical skills um, are increasingly important, being able to work with data using Excel and other programs, um, being able to manage projects. And the one thing I'm hearing now from health systems and from, from public health departments, they want people who know what their mission is and really are committed to the mission and to the population that those organizations serve. And that people who are gonna be adaptable, flexible and resilient, given the times that we're in and the uncertainty that we're facing and the need to reinvent you know, what we're doing. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, those are the broad public health career options. How do you discover and achieve your authentic health career path? And my role in public health now is to, is to help people discover and achieve your authentic health career early on and then navigate your path going forward. And I've written a book on how to do that. The next slide, please. Uh, it's called, You Don't Have to Be a Doctor, uh, Discover and Achieve Your Authentic Health Career. And if you're meant to be a doctor, particularly with public health, we need you, we want you. We're going to support you all the way. We just want to make sure that that's the right path for you. Um, but this book has a nine-step model on how you go from where you are to where you want to be and how do you pick amongst all those different health career, public health career options that are out there and how you make sure it's aligned with who you are. Because the next slide is the, um, we really want you to, to become clear about who you are so that you can decide what you really, what's the best for you the first time around. And the next slide is all about you discovering and achieving your authentic health career. And the term authentic is really important because there's only one of you in the whole universe. There's only, uh, and you're here to make a certain kind of impact. You have uh, your own lived experience and passions and talents. 
So your authentic health career is the one that suits your unique, unique talents, passions, goals, and lived experience. And I know you can do it because I've achieved it myself and helped thousands of people to be able to do it. The next slide, please. And how you do this is you begin to align what employers need and what are health employers need, what are those opportunities? So that's what we talked about earlier. What are the career paths? What are the skills that people are looking for? And if you align that with your values, passions, and goals, that's what you really want with what you're good at and enjoy doing, um, you can have the power. Um, it's a powerful combination because there's a need for what you have. You'll work hard. You'll be good at it. You'll, be, you'll bring all your, your authentic self to it, and you'll achieve these rewards in the middle of fulfilling work, financial rewards, um, and it really impacts your health and happiness to also be living your authentic health career. It doesn't happen right away. Sometimes we're just trying to deal with the pandemic, school online, paying the bills, dealing with organic chemistry, whatever it is. But then we're kind of in that searching phase where you know, it, took, it takes a while to figure out what you wanna do and then it can all come together and be powerful. So the next slide. So how do you get to, to make, find this alignment? And first of all, I should just tell you, you're exactly where you're supposed to be. Um, whether you know exactly what you wanna do or whether you're more confused than ever, you know, just go forward, believe it is possible. And here's my framework on how to do that. The next slide. And this is my book is based on this. These are the chapters of my book, basically. Your job is to get as much exposure to what's possible to be able to, uh, that's the top of the triangle, what's needed there in the world, right? And, and we just talked about some of the careers and skills. Um, what Then the bottom of the triangle is, what are your values? What are you passionate about? What are you good at? You know, Who are you? And mapping that onto the careers that are out there that you get exposed to. You then have to get practical experience to be able to validate what you really won't know is important. And I all encourage all of you to get paid work experience before going to graduate school so that you know what you really want, you know what you want to get out of it, and you can make the most of it going forward. You can be in the right program. And practical experience is important. You then have to pick the direction that you're going to go in and get the education that you need. Notice the education isn't first. Like I always talk to students, what do you want to do? I want to get my MPH. Your MPH and which program degree in school you go to should follow your career direction that you want to go in. You then have to brand yourself and be good at packaging with resumes, LinkedIn profiles, interviewing skills. And you got to have a good support network. It's either network or not work. And so you've got to be able to be sure you build that along the way. You've got to believe that your authentic health career is the one that's going to best suit you um, and have the belief and courage will happen. Um, and then realize this is going to, the world's going to change, you're going to change, and that you can adjust. So in my book, there's, a, there's all the detail about the tools and stories and examples of how you do these things, but you can use this to diagnose what do you need? Do I need more exposure? Do I need more experience? Do I need a stronger network? Then take action to do that. The next slide, please. So finally, what you can do now to take that action is, next slide, is to put yourself in the flow of people and opportunities. And I think right now, even though it's virtual, you can still do informational interviews, you can still do your networking. Um, that's really critical more than ever. And you can access people now that maybe you couldn't before. Um, and then it's important along your journey just to follow your passion and your purpose. It will lead you um, to where you wanna go. Um, and then leverage the mentors that you have and lead from where you are as a student, as a club leader, as a community member, as a church member, and then things will develop and then be open with the possibilities. If you didn't think about those different sectors before working in the private sector, be open to it, you know, and then develop a good web-based strategy to help you go along. And finally, um, part of being in the flow is developing, next slide please, um, is developing some resources. I'm gonna skip this because I think we're gonna share this later. And finally, I'm gonna share um, a couple things I do. I have health career conversations every, um, uh, every week um, on Wednesdays for free that you can join that uh, with different health leaders about different topics and answering your questions. And then I do run next slide is Health Career Connection, um, which is a national nonprofit that inspires, empowers undergraduate students to pursue public health careers and healthcare careers, 10 week paid full-time internships in nine regions of the country, including California, New York, and uh, DC and New England and North Carolina, Tennessee. Our application open today for HCC, so, so check it out. So those are the things that, that are happening in public health and um, the different career paths and what you can do now. And I'm now gonna, because um, I know if you advance confidently in the direction of your dreams, you're gonna be successful. 
And this example of someone who's done that um, is one of my former students and Health Career Connection alums, Denise Fair, who's gonna take it from here. Denise. Hey, thank you so much, Jeff. Let me just say how excited I am to be here. Um, it looks like there's over 500 people on the call today. So um, let me first, before I begin, there are two things I wanna make sure you do before I even share with you my career path. One, go and get Jeff's book. Um, he's, he's pretty humble, but I'm gonna tell you right now, go and get it. It's available right now on Amazon. Get it, read it, take some good notes. Um, that'll help to propel your career forward. The second thing is today there's gonna be quite a few presenters um, with various, uh, various careers. So listen to us, figure out what you like, and find us on LinkedIn and send us a message and ask for an informational interview. We'd love to all um, have a chance to speak with you about our journey. So those are the two things I wanna make sure that you do. If you hear nothing else um, about our journey, please uh, go ahead and get Jeff's book and also reach out to us on LinkedIn. So first again, let me just uh, say how glad I am to be here. I love sharing my perspective about public health and it's pretty different because my goal since I was five years old uh, was to be a doctor. Um, I met Dr. Ben Carson um, when I was really young and I really enjoyed listening to him about his career path. And all throughout high school, all throughout college, that's what I was set on. I wanted to be a doctor. In fact, I was so specific. I wanted to be the ninth female African-American neurosurgeon. However, I quickly found out that I didn't like science and I wasn't really passing my classes, but I still wanted to be a doctor and I wanted to provide individual patient care. But I think it was my like the end of my junior year. So I've already been through a couple years of college, but end of my junior year, I decided I don't really see myself providing individual patient care. And I knew there had to be something else out there. So I was in the middle of taking my MCAT classes, um, preparing for the MCAT. And I remember trying to visualize being a doctor and having the white coat on, um, but I couldn't see it. And so I left that class, put my pencil and my books there and went to my school counselor and said, you know, I've only known um, that I want to be a doctor. I don't know what else is out there, but there has to be something for me because I know I want to be um, in healthcare. I feel called to, uh, to this industry. And so uh, Ms. Alzora Holland, who was my counselor at the time, shared with me that you know, there's an opportunity in public health. And she said, Denise, you are a natural leader, so you should think about public health. I also found, um, I found out about the uh, health, uh, health Career Connection, and I'm now an alum, a very proud alum, um, and so between the summer of University of Michigan and also going to UC Berkeley to get my master's, I did a, a, a three month internship at Kaiser Permanente with HCC. And that really changed my perspective. And um, I was able to learn more about healthcare administration under public health. So I finished up at uh, UC Berkeley where I received my master's in public health, focusing on health policy and management. And then I decided that I wanted to do a uh, a, a fellowship, an administrative fellowship at Trinity Health, a back home where I'm from in Michigan. And I spent a year serving under uh, um, Joe Swedish, who was the CEO at the time, and really learned about how to be a healthcare administrator. Um, I was there for about a year, and then I transitioned uh, to another role within Trinity Health as a, a medical group administrator, overseeing several primary care clinics for a couple of years, and then I went back to uh, the corporate office, um, served as a senior consultant uh, for a couple of years, and then spent the last uh, couple of years at Henry Ford Health System, um, managing several large primary care uh, centers. Now, a mentor of mine shared with me years ago that the moment where, the moment when you feel um, like you're no longer able to be challenged, you're just feeling a little bit apathetic, you're feeling like there's something else out there, then it's really time to move on. And so I remembered about you know, the conversations that I had through informational interviews with other public health experts, with other CEOs, and I really wanted to make a transition into something different. Um, so I was at Henry Ford for a couple of years, and then I received a call from uh, city government um, to lead 
the uh, Detroit Health Department, which is what I do right now. So I'm currently the Chief Public Health Officer for the Detroit Health Department, and I love what I do. Um, I, I lead uh, an entire city of about 700,000 residents, and I make sure that they are healthy and they're well. And the vision of the health department here is to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to thrive. And we have over 40 programs throughout the city, from environmental health to our WIC programs, our immunizations programs, our food and safety. We even have an animal care shelter. Um, I have a team of epidemiologists. Um, and it's, it's, really, it's a really interesting time right now uh, to be in the field of public health. So I just started this role about a year ago. So in September, that was when I was appointed. And then six months into my new role, COVID hit. And my life has completely changed. Um, not only my life, but my senior leadership team and those who work with us. And so for the last uh, several months, last seven months, I've been leading the COVID-19 response throughout the city. Um, and you know the role of the health department during the middle of a pandemic is to provide communication, education, surveillance, and emergency preparedness. And this is a citywide effort. Um, and so in my role, I've been working really closely with Mayor Mike Duggan, who's the mayor of the city of Detroit. And so far we have tested several thousands of, um, of, our, of our residents. We've stood up a drive-through testing strategy um, to ensure that every Detroiter has the opportunity to get tested um, to see if they have COVID. We, did, we had a, a robust communication strategy um, focusing on the entire city. So it was press conferences that were daily, um, several PSAs and, and TV and you know, commercials. Um, we had a lot of opportunity to focus on social media efforts. And so whether it was Snapchat or uh, Facebook Live or Instagram videos. We wanted to make sure we communicated to everyone within the city. Um, and then we also made sure that our nursing home and our homeless populations, they also had the opportunity to get tested. Um, and so I sent a team of, of nurses and medical assistants directly to 26 nursing homes uh, within 10 days. And we were able to test about 2000 um, nursing home residents. And so. So far, again, we've done an incredible job in the city of Detroit. We have, uh, we have over 15,000 uh, cases and the cases are continuing to uh, surge, but we continue to stay focused. Um, and again, I, I absolutely love what I do and there is so much more um, to do at the health department. Right now we're focusing on our flu vaccination campaign. There still is a lot of hesitancy uh, when it comes to um, our Detroit residents getting the flu, but we're still moving forward. Um, and we're also focusing on just ensuring that we're providing equitable access. You'll hear some of my colleagues talk about their efforts with health equity, um, but that's something that we're, well, we're definitely focusing on in the city of Detroit. Uh, COVID-19 has really shed some light on a lot of the health disparities and inequities that exist. Um, but again, we really need to make sure that we're focusing on uh, continuing to provide support for the city. So in the field of public health, there is a lot that you can do. Again, you can be a health officer running a health department. You can be an epidemiologist uh, helping to lead a major pandemic and providing uh, data and analysis. Uh, you could be an inspector um, working in, in, in different fields and, and making sure that businesses have uh, licenses to support um, their work. You could be a behavioral health counselor. So there's so much that you can do. And again, if you have any questions, be uh, really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Um, but please make sure that you know that you um, just again, you know that there's there's so much that that you can do in in public health as long as you focus on your passion. Um, we we need you. Um, so if you are considering a, a a role in public health and getting a master's please consider that. Um, and so with that, I'll turn it over next uh, to, I believe, Nicole, who will be sharing her story about um, her work in public health. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. I wholeheartedly echo um, so much of what you shared about our amazing field in public health and also what Jeff shared about his passions for public health and walking all of the 
500 plus attendees on this uh, exciting webinar today and walking you all through what what's what's out there um and again i think i just wonder and really wish that i could have attended a webinar like this even when i was starting to chart my path in public health uh, but public health is definitely a, a, a more uh, uh recognized field now than ever before um you know since the founding of the very first schools of public health over 100 years ago i think um people uh now more than ever certainly get what our field is about um and that's great that's a great moment for us but i would say it's also of course quite unfortunate uh that it took perhaps a pandemic to to really showcase what our field is all about but i think um there's nothing but uh uh, great promise, if you will, for what you all will be able to do and contribute to our field. So I'm going to do a few things when I, as I walk you all through my career. I use this linear, or not linear, this curved uh, line here to really demonstrate that uh, public health careers are not always linear. They take you uh, from one place to another. Um, within my career, I've had the great fortune of living in over 10 different cities across um, the US, uh, uh, whether it was for educational purposes or work purposes. Um, I've pivoted quite a bit in my career and I have uh, been a student of this field of public health for about 16 years. And what I can say is that um, what I've been able to achieve um, has largely been based on having uh, very intentional exposure, as Jeff mentioned, um, uh, to the field uh, through various programs organized to meet the needs uh, of our uh, the workforce needs and diversifying the public health workforce. So I am a uh, grateful participant in several programs focused on uh, bringing more black healthcare leaders uh, and, and black public health leaders into the field and into the fold. Um, and then I'd also say um, you should be thinking about what's not even possible yet in our field. And, and a colleague of mine most recently at Lyft said he was brought to Lyft because he thought being at this particular company at this time could help solve um, problems that people don't even know that they have. So I was reflecting and actually it's um it's interesting so just eight years ago i took my very first lift ride actually at the american public health association conference as i attended uh, uh as a young professional working at that time at the u.s department of health and human services but i i'm reflecting on my very first lift ride because i can say wholeheartedly uh that i could have never imagined that when i started setting out to work in this field uh, about 16 years ago that I would be in the role that I'm in now, uh, leading healthcare policy for uh, the largest uh, rideshare company that makes investments in medical transportation in the country. And that's because rideshare as an industry didn't even exist. Um, so there, are, there are, are things that you all will continue to work on downstream within your careers that literally aren't even possible and, and have not yet been created. So keep that in mind as you chart your own careers. And I loved uh, Jeff's uh, emphasis uh, appropriately placed on uh, being authentic in your own journey and thinking about the things that are most important to you that have that have pulled you uh, to, to even consider a career in this field. It is a very rewarding field and it's one that um, I've been able to bring to bear many of my passions and my most heartfelt uh, uh, issue areas uh, around, as Jeff said, this being really a social justice calling um, in a field that allows people who want to in some way support social justice to do so. So I'll uh, share a little bit more about myself and my career journey. Um, I'm originally from inner city Washington, D.C. I actually currently live here in D.C. And um, I, I share that because I received uh, the Gates Millennium Scholarship. Uh, as a senior in high school in inner city DC, uh, a, a scholarship dedicated to students of color uh, with promise who live below the poverty level. I uh, received that scholarship as a senior in high school and it put me on the path that I'm on now and it actually helped me to discover the field of public health. Um, so I went on to Spelman College uh, where I majored in sociology, but first I was, I was actually uh, a chemistry pre-medical student, um, but uh, as, as Denise, you know, so candidly shared, I too had to discover that chemistry was not my passion. Uh, and I'm so glad that I was able to uh, pivot quite quickly to the field of public health. And the way that I discovered our field is actually one day I got an email from the Gates Millennium Scholars Program saying that public health was becoming a funded area um, for scholars to pursue. 
Uh, and I, at that time, they were uh, solely funding um, science uh, and STEM related um, uh, fields. And so I didn't know what public health was. And I remember I, I was going to say I Googled it, but I, I Yahooed it. Uh, the term that is, and I came up with a website called whatispublichealth.org. And I actually went to find this website last night. I'm not sure if it's still up or not. It didn't, I didn't, I couldn't surface it. However, I went to the site and I saw uh, largely what Jeff described, that within the field of public health, there were so many things that you could do. You could become an actual scientist and pursue biostatistics, epidemiology, environmental health, et cetera. Uh, and you could also pursue, of course, behavioral health, health management and policy, uh, and many other uh, subspecialties. And so I realized at that point that I was mostly interested in health policy and management, being from Washington, D.C., certainly having uh, seen many of my family members, for example, work for the federal government in various policy related roles. And so I also thought about what I wanted to do within the field of public health um, as I got to know much more about the field and how I wanted to make change at the highest level nationally uh, and thinking about the role that policy change uh, certainly has uh, across the country. So that's how I sort of start out, started out with my path. I, I started then taking courses at Morehouse College, uh, the Brother Institutions of Spelman College. And um, I, at the time, uh, public health was a minor uh, at, at Morehouse. It's now an official minor at Spelman College, which is terrific and showcases really the growth and interest in the field. Um, and I was at that point in an intro to public health course. And I started um, getting really steeped in uh, the learnings around social epidemiology in particular and health disparities and realizing that I had indeed uh, been a health disparity um, and had seen for health disparities play out firsthand from the low income uh, community that I grew up in in inner city DC. And I started to get uh, more impassioned about um, changing what I had seen, uh, realizing that it was not uh, the norm uh, and that what I was seeing was an outlier and really, you know, this, the, the, out, uh, the outcomes and outputs of a very inequitable U.S. healthcare system where people um, are largely without health care coverage, uh, seek care through uh, free uh, health clinics, um, and also uh, go on and off insurance and, and, not, and are not well. And that had certainly been the case within my own family. Um, unit and then in, in my community and I wanted to get again to do something about it. So I started feeling great about this this discovery, if you will, of the field and I'm glad that I did. Uh, and so let's see. As I was uh, rounding out what what I would make of my career in public health and doing more research on what it meant to get a graduate degree in the field, I stumbled across by again yahooing.com, not googling, um, uh, summer internships, and I came across the summer enrichment program in health management and policy that was offered at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. I applied for the program and ended up doing that summer internship uh, in the summer between my sophomore and junior year in college, and that program still exists. It was created nearly. 30, uh, 35 plus years ago, uh, again, with the, with the focus on diversifying the field of healthcare management, hospital administration, as Jeff, Jeff started to describe what that field actually encompasses. And so I um, completed that internship. I worked at an, uh, a hospital, a Trinity Health Hospital, right outside of Detroit, and again, had my, fuel, my passions fuel. However, I realized that I didn't necessarily want to become a hospital administrator, um, and that, uh, again, that policy would probably be the route that I would, I would take. So so I then actually did an exchange semester from Spelman as the first student to ever do an exchange semester uh, uh, from Spelman College to UC Berkeley. That's actually where I met Denise when she was a graduate student at the Berkeley School of uh, Public Health. And that's where I met Jeff in his role as dean at the school. And uh, it was at that time that I applied for the Health Career Connection Internship Program. And that summer, I interned at the Alameda County Public Health Department uh, uh, with which is the surrounding uh, community uh, and representing the county uh, where Oakland, California is in the Bay Area. That was terrific exposure to me on what it takes to actually run a, a, a health equity focused uh, health department at the local and county level. And it was a, a, a great perspective for me to have. And again, uh, emphasize and reinforce rather uh, my desire to keep working in health policy. And so let's see, I then um, went, uh, to the University of Michigan School of Public Health to get my MPH in health management and policy after applying for several programs focused on health management and policy across the country. And while I was um, uh, in the health management and policy department at Michigan and moving to Ann Arbor for that training, I interned at the Metro Plus Health Plan. Um, so that was my first exposure to working in health insurance. Uh, on, uh, on that point, working for um, the Medicaid managed care organization that is owned by the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation. It's a nonprofit 
off the uh, Medicaid health plan. And again, it was a terrific experience for me, showed me that I really had a dedicated uh, interest in working on behalf of Medicaid populations and certainly focusing on the U.S. healthcare safety net. So again, learning much more about the field uh, with very um, specific hands-on uh, experiences provided through internships. I then uh, went back to the University of Michigan, completed my master's in public health, and got a terrific call as I was uh, wrapping up my degree um, and I actually had the great fortune of being recruited to work within the Obama administration as a health policy advisor at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So I packed my bags and I moved back to D.C. to be a political appointee, which really was my dream uh, from even my undergraduate uh, days. I spent four years at HHS. The first year was spent as a policy advisor working for the chief of staff uh, at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. I then spent a few months working in in uh, public affairs and external communications, uh, looking at uh, racial and ethnic media uh, uh, across the country and coordinating um, uh, affairs for Secretary Kathleen Sebelius. So she was the secretary of HHS at that time. Uh, and then I spent about 18 months at the Federal Office of Minority Health. Again, a dream come true, really, uh, from the standpoint of my early on days, recognizing what health disparities and health inequities were, and realizing that there was a dedicated federal agency uh, with broad remit to help, uh, in some ways, reduce those disparities. And I was fortunate enough to work on the very first team that helped with uh, department-wide implementation of what was called the HHS Action Plan to Reduce Racial and Ethnic Health Disparities, which was awesome. And then I rounded up my time at HHS and my four different roles in the agency that really helped me to see what, uh, what broad limit the, the agency actually had for improving the health of uh, our, uh, everyone across the country. Uh, I worked on healthcare.gov, the, uh, the dedicated online platform that helped millions of people enroll in health insurance coverage in the very first open enrollment period uh, under the ACA uh, back in 2013. Uh, and so I then at that point realized that it was time for me to go back to graduate school. I, I knew that I had uh, funding from the Gates Foundation, as I previously mentioned, and that allowed me actually and funded me to go for my undergrad, my master's, and my doctoral degree. And at that time, the Harvard School of Public Health was creating a brand new doctor of public health program. Uh, and I went on their website and I saw, they didn't have a whole lot actually up on the site at that time. And I saw the words change, innovation, and leadership. And I thought, that's what I want to do uh, with my career, continue doing that is. And uh, I actually enrolled in that program, packed my bags, moved to Boston, um, and um, had a terrific time in that program, which I actually completed in three years as the very first graduate of the brand new Doctor of Public Health program uh, at Harvard. And in the time, in that time there, uh, the focus the focus of the program is largely to to keep producing um, uh, leaders uh, and accelerate the, the leadership career path. Uh, for uh, uh, both U.S. and domestic and global uh, focused uh, healthcare leaders, folks, and many of my classmates actually uh, are on track uh, uh, to become health ministers in their respective countries uh, across the globe. And I used that time to really think a lot about where I wanted to go next with my career and accelerating what I would do next and really started thinking about the private sector even more as I was leaving government, of course, for my four years at HHS. And I thought about the role that payers were going to be uh, playing even more in the U.S. healthcare system given health reform, which was the, the focus of my work at HHS and implementing the Affordable Care Act. And um, I landed with wanting to do, you know more, much more about large payers like Humana, for example, and I ended up spending some time as a summer associate actually working for the chief medical officer of Humana on a brand new set of population health improvement initiatives that they were um, uh, launching across the country. So it was very exciting, again, to bring to bear all of my public health skills to this very specific public health need that a large health insurance company was actually working to address. Um, and I also spent some time working in community, community benefit at the Intermountain uh, Hospital uh, System based in Salt Lake City. Again, another experience that was experiential for me to really get my feet wet in what was called the, the field immersion that were required within the DRPH program at Harvard. And um, it was interesting. So as, as they uh, were conceiving of this program, um, the DRPH program that is, they uh, thought through what it would look like for students and still 
provide this opportunity to actually work within the field as they write their dissertations. So I use that opportunity again to pack up my bags and move to Minneapolis, Minnesota, which was uh, and still is the global headquarters of United Health Group. United Health Group is the largest healthcare company in the country, the largest health insurance company. And I started a role as a director of strategy uh, within the Medicaid business at United Healthcare, and thinking about uh, the ways in which the health plan was trying to address the true social determinants of health needs of its most vulnerable Medicaid members, thinking about the, the members who were highest cost and highest need, uh, particularly those who were uh, who were precariously housed, who struggled with homelessness, and many, many other issues, including substance use uh, and other mental uh, health issues that were going unaddressed. So that was my job. Um, again, thinking about what public health is all about and bringing that to bear in the private sector. I ended up spending four years at United Healthcare um, and United Health Group. My very last role was in leading uh, uh, as vice president of corporate social responsibility, uh, a, a first of its kind role at the company that allowed me to think about how the company could invest its many resources into local communities. Um, so, uh, you know, as, as we think about the growth of community benefit as an industry, um, the same can be said about corporate social impact, both within healthcare and many other industries. But I had the great fortune of leading corporate philanthropy, making, doing grant making, uh, and leading a team that was also responsible for employee volunteerism and really shaping out how that particular company showed up in community. So it was uh, very, very re rewarding. Um, and then it, at that point, I got a call uh, about a new role at Lyft. Um, and, and that's where I am today, back in DC, my home, and thinking about uh, every day the role that Lyft can play in really helping communities that need it most with medical transportation. I'm in a very uh, unique role that actually didn't exist. Uh, and again, ride share didn't exist when I was thinking about my career in ago. So I could have never guessed, even <laughs> seven months ago that I'd be in this role, but here I am. And so in the new role, I'm actually responsible for developing and managing Lyft's national healthcare policy agenda and working to expand uh, Lyft's presence in the non-emergency medical transportation space, as well as supporting Lyft's broader healthcare strategy. So on a day-to-day -day basis, to break it down a little bit, I work very closely with Lyft's business development, government relations, compliance, and strategy leaders to partner with government agencies, both at the federal level and at the state level uh, across the country, really, to, to launch and scale rideshare-based medical transportation. Uh, and personally, I continue to bring to bear the deep commitment that I have to elevating Lyft's approach to addressing the needs of underserved communities across the country, including those uh, with Medicare and Medicaid coverage, rural and urban communities, and other who face difficulty with getting access to care and who struggle with accessing various social determinants of health, like getting fresh food, uh, fresh and affordable food, that is, and other basic resources. Um, and just this backdrop, you know, 95% of the U.S. population has access to a, to a lift ride on any given day, and of course, uh, in a typical year. And of course, 2020 has been anything but a typical year. But our goal, really, through providing uh, resources uh, for medical, for patients across the U.S. healthcare system, our goal is to increase access to care and to provide a needed intervention to address transportation insecurity and transportation barriers for communities that are disproportionately affected by the social determinants of health. And so we serve Medicaid members, uh, Medicare Advantage members, uh, and health system patients across the system. And so far, we have actually done um, some research uh, on our outcomes, of course, to show that we are indeed improving access to care, uh, reducing the strain on overburdened uh, emergency rooms, and providing a better overall healthcare experience. And we do that by working with top uh, payers uh, and, and health insurance companies across the country, and also top healthcare providers and hospitals across the country who entrust, uh, um, they entrust us to help them uh, move their patients to and from the various healthcare settings that, um, that, they, that they need to get to every day to live healthy lives. And we're excited about uh, that. And I also uh, would just love to share that just last week, uh, we, we launched what's called a Lift for Epic, which allows uh, us to partner with, with Epic, uh, the largest electronic health record uh, uh, in the country, uh, to now allow staff within hospitals across the country to uh, have embedded within uh, their, their panel that they see every day for a patient's medical record, to embed within there a, a button, a set of buttons that allow them to call a lift ride for four patients that they know are struggling with transportation access and who perhaps can't be discharged from an ER because they do not have a, a, a means to get home um, and, and really are struggling with uh, access to transportation. And that's just one example of um, uh, something that I get to do every day. And again, bringing to bear the many uh, things that I've learned about our field 
um, in a very new and cutting edge industry. So I'm excited to be talking to you all and hope that I get to answer some questions as well about my specific uh, career path. Great, so Lesford, I think you're up next. All right, excellent. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning to those of you who, uh, who like me, are out on the west side of, of America. Um, and uh, good afternoon to, to everyone else across the country. Um, it's, it's truly an honor and a privilege to, to, be, to be here, uh, to be able to share a little bit about my career path, which I believe is a very non-traditional uh, public health uh, career path. But I think, uh, I think one that, that hopefully uh, sparks some intrigue um, and some excitement there. So I, like many of you, um, kind of took this winding route and, and like many of my colleagues as well, um, took a very winding route into public health. Um, like uh, I'm sure many of you, I started out wanting to be a doctor as well. And uh, you know, coming from, coming from a home of two Jamaican parents um, and being one of the first in my family to go to college, uh, the expectation was really that I either become a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. Um, and so I chose doctor. Uh, and so um, I say that jokingly, but you know, so many of us came to this career um, really wanting to be healers. And we see that, that, that general trend, um, and yet the range of healing professions that we're introduced to when we're young um, often, so often seems so narrow and seems so limited. Um, and so hopefully this conversation is a part of many of the conversations that you'll be a part of um, and that you'll hopefully lead as well that really emphasizes that health and public health um, are, is really in all things from how we manage global pandemics to how cities are planned and developed um, to how we empower youth and protect them from violence to how we ensure access to health care for all. Um, and so a little bit about my career. My career is centered around um, how we effectively build resilience in children, youth, families, and communities, and especially those um, who've experienced trauma um, and adversity. Uh, but so to kind of take a step back, how, how, did, I, how did I get there? And, and even before I hop into the, the slides on adverse childhood experiences, um, I started out um, getting my bachelor's, uh, my bachelor's of science in biology from the University of Florida. Um, and my main focus while I was there was, um, was in infectious diseases. Um, I wanted uh, to do global medical work. I wanted to be like Paul, uh, like Paul Farmer, going to some of the most remote regions of the world to provide healthcare. Um, and then what I saw through, through both my travel and experience was how interconnected health was to the social determinants of health um, in many of these countries. Um, and in particular, the effects of violence and, and especially violence against women and children um, on the health and the economy um, and so many other elements of, of, of each of those societies. And so I really honed in, um, really focusing on human trafficking um, and other forms of violence against women globally. Uh, in grad school, I did my master's in public health and health policy and leadership um, at Loma Linda University. And there I focused on, um, I focused in on human trafficking, violence against children globally, but then also recognize how prevalent um, those really were here in the United States. Um, at that time, approximately 15 to 20,000 children um, were being trafficked into the United States each year. But even, even more so was really the human trafficking that was happening, um, you know, right down the street. Um, and it, it, it was estimated that over, at that time that there were over 100,000 um, U.S. born children who were trafficked each year. Um, more recent statistics estimated at 200,000 and, and, and those statistics um, very, very much vary because it's, it's su human trafficking is such an issue that, 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 that um, is such a difficult issue to really, really get a handle on. So in, in 2012, um, I went on to work on a, a statewide uh, ballot proposition, uh, California Proposition 35, and that was a ballot initiative focused on increasing penalties for child trafficking um, and providing more services for victims of, of trafficking and commercial sexual exploitation of children. 
what we saw in 2012 was a huge level of awareness that was created and developed um, across communities about uh, the prevalence of the issue right here at home and and not uh, and, and people shifted from seeing human trafficking as an issue that happened abroad to an issue that, that happens right down the street and that is more pressing um, than we can ever imagine. Proposition 35 passed as one of the most popular ballot, uh, ballot measures in California history at the time. And so we were really excited about that work. Um, from there, just kind of fast tracking to the uh, Fast tracking through, um, I briefly worked uh, as a global citizenship fellow with the U.S. Fund for UNICEF, um, advancing domestic policies um, around uh, or against child violence and promoting um, programs both globally um, and domestically. Uh, I then came to uh, San Bernardino County as I was introduced um, as the child abuse prevention coordinator, where I monitored incidences of child abuse and neglect across the county, facilitated uh, interdepartmental collaborations to address the issue that was a clear epidemic in our communities, and con uh, conducted campaigns to increase uh, child abuse reporting, father engagement, and youth mentorship, uh, really aimed at preventing child abuse, but then also looking at how do we effectively develop resilience. Um, and youth that have experienced uh, adversity, uh, youth that were, that were already system involved in the child welfare system or in group homes, um, and educated communities on ACEs. So um, I wanted to, to spend just a brief amount of time just kind of giving a, a high level overview of what ACEs are, um, adverse childhood experiences. We could uh, switch to the next slide. So adverse, adverse childhood experiences uh, or the Adverse Childhood Experience Study, um, I believe is a study that every single one of you um, that's working in public health uh, need to know about, uh, need to understand, um, definitely read um, uh, read uh, the, initial, the initial papers that were published on it, as well as some of the more recent uh, information that, 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 uh, that has come out about adverse childhood experiences. But it, adverse childhood experiences was uh, coined by Dr. Robert Block, the former uh, president of the American uh, Academy of Pediatrics, as one of the single most, if not the single most, unaddressed public health issues um, facing, facing our country and really facing our world. Uh, what, we, what we see, so what the Adverse Childhood Experience uh, study does is it makes the connection between early adverse childhood um, events, childhood traumatic exposures, such as child abuse, neglect, household dysfunction. It connects those to negative physical and behavioral health um, outcomes later on in life in such a way that we see almost direct connections between childhood trauma and chronic diseases later on in life that can be prevented. Um, and that can be mitigated, and, and that trauma, the impact of that trauma can be mitigated, but we have to be aware of it. Next slide. Um, so th this is a high level overview of, of, uh, of some of the, the forms or some of the types of adverse childhood experiences that, that were studied. I won't dive uh, too deep into it. Um, I do provide a, a, a more full presentation on adverse childhood experiences and resilience, but just to kind of give a high level overview, these are some of the forms of childhood um, experiences. And then if we could skip down two slides. And these were some of the effects um, that, that we saw or some of the correlations that were, that were made. Um, and so what we see is that um, individuals that have experienced adverse childhood experiences and especially at high rates, um, we see an increased likelihood of lack of physical activity and obesity later on in life, an increased likelihood of smoking, alcoholism, drug use, maladaptive behaviors, um, and even an increase or, or even a decrease in productivity and, and work performance, as well as um, other physical and mental health issues such as um, such as depression, suicidality, um, contracting STDs, heart disease, and so forth. Next slide. And so these are some of the ways that adverse childhood experiences affect systems. I won't dive too deep. So actually, I'll skip down uh, two, two more slides just uh, in the interest of time and to, to get to some questions. Um, but really what this research brought me to was just this understanding of resilience. 
Um, so understanding that you know there's there are these mechanisms in place that connect uh, childhood adversity to negative lifelong outcomes, but that that can be interrupted through resilience and resilience resilience building programs, um, whether it be in in education, in the healthcare sector, um, or other sectors, law enforcement, and so forth. Next slide. So resilience being the capacity to, to maintain or to develop competent uh, functioning in the face of life stress, uh, life, uh, life stressors um, can really be developed through these four main domains that, that were identified by Devro um, through positive supportive relationships, through an internal belief, um, through a sense of initiative and, and, pow and empowerment to be able to affect change not only in your life, but in the lives of others and the ability to self-control or to self-regulate um, as well. And so that leads me to the work that I do now at Outdoor Outreach and we can go to the next slide. Uh, out, so after leaving the county, I, I worked as the child abuse prevention coordinator and then briefly worked as a cultural competency officer ensuring health equity and how mental health services were delivered. Um, and then I, 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 I wanted to really follow my passion. So as an outdoorsman myself, an ultra marathon runner, trailer, a backpacker, um, a mountaineer, I really saw the resilience building effects that the outdoors had in my life. Um, I wanted to create that opportunity for youth um, that, that were otherwise, that, that were marginalized, that were at risk, um, or that were already system involved. Um, and Outdoor Outreach was doing much of that work. Outdoor Outreach has been around for over 20 years, based here in San Diego. Um, and we work to, try to introduce youth, especially youth that, that lack access to the transformative power of the outdoors, recognizing um, that the outdoors can be incredibly healing. Um, what we've seen through some of the research uh, out, of, out of labs such as uh, the Center for Nature and Health um, based in Oakland, Dr. Nusheen Razani's work um, is phenomenal. Um, if, you, if you care to do a deeper dive, I definitely encourage you to check, uh, to, to check them out. Um, she does a, a tremendous amount of work in prescribing nature for health um, and, and, and identifying the, uh, the effects of, of connecting, um, especially children and youth, uh, to the outdoors. So outdoor outreach connects thousands of youth each year uh, to the outdoors through a number of different experiences. And we can go to the next slide. Whether it be surfing, kayaking, indoor outdoor rock climbing, um, overnight backpacking trips, snowboarding uh, up in Big Bear, youth are introduced to, uh, to a new sense of possibility and opportunity. Um, they're connected to positive supportive peers that lift them up and that help to build their resilience. Um, and they, they discover new ways to explore the world um, and to be able to navigate some of the challenges that exist in the world. Let me give an example of that. Next slide. One of our, one of our, uh, one of our recent program partnerships that we started in 2019 was with Radies Children's Hospital here in San Diego, uh, where we worked with particularly youth in their mental health outpatient unit um, and engaged them over an eight week period um, with intensive uh, outdoor programming opportunities. Here in this picture is Danielle, who uh, was such a rock star, such a champion. I remember on day one of the program, we told the youth, we're gonna take you out rock climbing. We're gonna take you um, out surfing in the, in the open ocean. And they were terrified. Um, but this was a quote from Danielle. She said, you know, it was scary, but I kept going and I made it to the top. And I can take that experience and apply it to life by thinking things through and going slowly and eventually you'll make it. Um, and Danielle uh, really thrived through the program, built connections um, and built a sense of resilience um, that has not only improved her health, but also her mental health and her well-being um, and the contributions that she'll make uh, to society as well. I have here just a few, a few additional pictures also, and we'll quickly go through, uh, next slide, uh, of some of the amazing feats that many of our, our, our youth are tackling, keeping in mind, and, and we can continue to, to flip through each of the pictures. Um, many of our youth come, um, come to us as recent arrivals, 
um, and they're overcoming a lot of trauma that they've experienced um, in refugee camps or otherwise. Uh, many, many of our youth um, have experienced mental illness. Um, many of our youth are system involved. We have a contract where we're, where we're working with probation. Um, and through our programs, they, they get to experience resilience, experience friendship. And these four guys um, are actually all now instructors with us as well. They were leadership program participants. And so they not only got to experience that resilience, but they're now also able to pass on that experience providing um, outdoor opportunities for youth um, in some of the same schools that, they, that they've come from. Um, and so our programs have been, have been really powerful in, in creating that, that healing effect. Um, and so how does that all connect back to public health? Um, as I mentioned at, at the beginning, healing can be found in so many different uh, professions. And so it's so important as each of you are exploring different pathways in, in public health um, to really look at and explore what, to use the, the, oft, the often cliche quote, look at what sets your soul on fire. What is that thing that you're most passionate about? What is that thing that you're most personally connected to? In my case, really working with, especially youth that have experienced violence, that was connected to me seeing uh, the effects that violence had had um, on many of my friends and extended family members and wanting to, to affect change there. So really looking at what's that one thing that you want to affect change in. The second thing I would say is expertise. Um, is not is definitely not bestowed at graduation from a public health degree, whether it be your bachelor's, your master's, or doctorate in public health. It's developed through ongoing learning. And so I remember as, as I was learning about human trafficking, I was also actively going out into the community and teaching about it as well. As I was learning about resilience, I was also going out and engaging others in, in that work as well. And then lastly, I would say, consider what other disciplines intersect with your work. Public health is very much a, co a collaborative uh, work. So even if, you're, if your lens is epidemiology, that is very much gonna connect to health policy and informing health, uh, sound health policy. Um, even if your focus is health education, uh, nutrition is gonna be a key piece of that as well. When communities aren't fed, it's hard to affect, uh, affect other health behavior changes as well. And so those, those would be my words of advice. Lastly, also um, definitely want to give a shout out to a program that I'm a senior fellow with as well, uh, the Atlantic Fellows for Health Equity, which is a phenomenal, phenomenal year long fellowship program um, that really connects um, interdisciplinary public health professionals from around the world who are looking to affect social justice change um, in their various spheres. And so uh, definitely wanted to put that out there as well. Um, hope that you have a chance to, to look into it. Um, and as, as my colleagues shared as well, I'm more than happy to, to connect as well. Feel free to reach out to any of us on LinkedIn. Um, if, if you want additional advice, I know that we'll be limited on time for Q&A, um, but I'm sure that each of us will be open to, to fielding, fielding questions offline as well. Thank you. And next I'll pass it over to Justine Koza. I was on mute. Good morning, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here and to be included with such accomplished and inspiring panelists. Um, I'm happy to talk to you today about, again, once again, a non-traditional path in public health. Next slide, please. So I received my undergraduate degree from UC Santa Barbara in comparative literature. And I remember at the time, many of my friends' parents would ask me, you know, what do you plan on doing with that degree? And truthfully, I didn't know at the time. At 18, 19, 20, I wasn't sure what my future held. But looking back, I know that getting a degree in comparative literature, it taught me invaluable communication skills, such as writing, which has been an essential skill throughout my public health career, and also analytical skills. And it afforded me the opportunity to spend a year in Spain, where I developed a strong foundation of the Spanish language and I also was introduced to my lifelong passion, flamenco. Next slide. After graduating, I was still a bit lost, not sure what I was gonna do with my comparative literature degree. Uh, so I went back to Spain, spent another nine months there. I was teaching English. I also worked as a telemarketer 
And that was a pretty miserable job getting hung up on hundreds of times a day. Um, but that taught me perseverance. It taught me to further strengthen my communication skills and it taught me to be bold. And so I came back from Spain and I dabbled in sales for a little bit. I used my telemarketing skills to get a sales job. And once again, that proved to not be a great fit for me. And so I was kind of at this quarter life crisis at the time, not sure what I was going to do with my future. I was working, I left sales and got a corporate job and was looking for an evening job to supplement my income. And I remember there was an ad in the paper. I know no one looks at papers anymore for jobs, but I was looking at a paper and there was an ad for a research assistant on a public health study. I didn't even know what public health was, but the hours were in the evening. They needed someone to call people on the phone and recruit them to participate in the study. So I went for it. And I remember the interview, when they interviewed me, they thought I had an unusual background, but they thought, well, she's got a lot of telemarketing skills. If she can convince people to buy copier machines, maybe she can convince people to participate in a public health research study. So they took a chance on me and public health, the world of public health opened up to me. I worked for Dr. Jim Salas, who is a pioneer in the field of physical activity research and its relation to the built environment. And I worked for him on a study called the Neighborhood Quality of Life Study that looks at how one's neighborhood impacts your physical and mental health. And I just completely fell in love. He encouraged me to get my master's in public health. And I remember at the time I decided to reach out to an esteemed professor at the local graduate school. And I remember meeting with that professor and he told me, he said, well, you don't have a health sciences background. I'm not sure how well you'll do in this public health program. While that was discouraging, I persevered. I knew rejection and I went for it anyway. And luckily I was accepted into the Masters of Public Health program at San Diego State University. Next slide. So I did my Masters in Public Health around 2004. I have to say this was an incredible experience. I had, you know, was still learning about the public health field and the time in this Masters degree program was so influential and pivotal in my life. I took many courses that allowed me to do field work, field experiences, and some of those courses allowed me to do field work actually in Baja California, Mexico, which is just about 20 miles south of where we are here in San Diego. And so I really sought out those experiences that allowed me to use my Spanish and be in the field and get practical skills. Um, I also, during that time, I remember one of my courses, we had a group project where we had to develop health communication messages around the importance of HIV testing. And they connected us with someone in the field. And that person was Dr. Maria Luisa Zuniga, who will later became my mentor, boss, and very close friend. But I remember at the time, I just thought, this woman is incredible and I would, it would be a dream come true to work with her one day. And so towards the end of my master's degree program, I um, applied for a student grant and I did some work in Oaxaca, Mexico for a month. I worked on a lead prevention program. And when I returned from, from that project, one of my classmates tapped me on the shoulder, I remember, and, and she said, uh, there's a project coordinator position opening up on one of our studies at UC San Diego. Would you be interested in applying? So I want to share that story because in my master's degree program, the classes and the courses were so influential, but what else was really important, and our first speaker uh, mentioned this, was the networking, the people that I met, the professors, the professionals, but also my classmates. So next slide. So I applied for that UC San Diego job. I got it. I became the coordinator of a large health disparities research center. I also worked on a nutrition intervention. And I even spent some time while I was at UCSD working on health sciences pipeline education programs. Um, so while I was at UCSD, the person sitting in the office next to me was Dr. Maria Luisa Zuniga, the woman I had met during my program. And one day I got up the courage, I went to her office and I said, it would be a dream to work on one of your projects with you. And that dream came true. She was looking for a project manager for her cross-border HIV research studies and she hired me. So I worked with Dr. Maria Luisa Zuniga. I used the skills I learned in my MPH program. 
um, project coordination, you know, all the group projects that you do in a master's level program, they all proved to be very beneficial. I was great at coordinating projects. I used the writing skills I, you know, harm, um, that I worked on in my undergraduate degree program and constantly practiced that helped me write grants and progress reports. I worked on a lot of large NIH studies that were cross-border, again, focused on HIV, barriers to care, stigma, things like that. And aside from all those wonderful research skills I developed, I also learned the importance of cultural humility and working in an international context. So I had completely found my passion. I found my focus. I loved working on cross-border studies. Again, San Diego, Tijuana, Baja, California, Mexico studies, and really realized that was my niche. Also during that time working with Dr. Zuniga on these cross-border studies, I applied for a Rotary sponsored vocational exchange and spent a month in Kenya um, learning about their healthcare systems. And I also participated in a program called Leaders Across Borders, which was a 10 month long leadership training program. And in that program, I also met another woman who became a mentor, a dear friend, and she encouraged me to apply for a job at the County of San Diego managing cross-border public health programs. Next slide. So that brings me to where I am now. I work for the County of San Diego Office of Border Health within our Health and Human Services Agency. And for those of you who aren't familiar with San Diego, we share a border with Tijuana, Baja, California, Mexico. It is considered the busiest border crossing in the entire world with approximately 150,000 northbound crossings in a single day. People cross the border in both directions for fun, for recreation, to see family, to go to work, to go to school, even for healthcare and many other reasons. So we are very much an interconnected, interdependent region. And from a public health perspective, we really see this region as one with a shared border, a shared community and a shared population. So it's very important that our public health leaders in both countries work together and address the needs of this shared community. We know that the border doesn't keep diseases out and we're very much seeing that right now with the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide. So I, I'm the chief for the Office of Border Health for the County of San Diego. And in my role, my main focus is to facilitate cross-border coordination, collaboration and communication. And really, you know, essential to my to my job and something I learned in the undergraduate graduate program and in all my jobs are the importance of building strong trusted partnerships and relationships and making sure that we keep our communication lines open. Um, relationships truly are everything and it really is what helps open doors. I use my research background to support cross border infectious disease surveillance efforts. I use all my project management skills that I again honed and learned in grad school and then carried on through all my project coordination jobs. Um, and I work on a variety of projects, everything from developing protocols around the transfer of trauma patients across the US-Mexico border to coordinating annual binational mental health conferences. Really, you know, lots of variety in the work I do. And again, central, <clears throat> excuse me, central to my role is really, you know, fostering an environment of health diplomacy, respect, understanding, and collaboration. And really, truly in the field of public health, if you won't get far without being willing to collaborate, that's really central to the work we do. Next slide. And just in closing, I think a lot of the panelists have touched on this you know, the importance of building your network, and that includes your classmates, your professors, professionals, mentors really help you, help guide you and help you figure out your path. We've talked about informational interviews. I just wanna say class projects and courses and internships. I've put those all on my resume before when I was earlier on in my career and they helped me get interviews. Something as simple as a class project. So don't underestimate the importance of the content and the classes that you take in your programs. Um, also, if you're from a non-traditional background, if you're not, you know, science all the way, there are transferable skills and, you know, really writing has been essential. It, it probably has been the most essential skill I've used throughout my career and I really developed that in my undergraduate degree studying comparative literature. Also, 
public health is so varied and we've heard that from the other speakers too. I have worked in mental health, I've worked in intimate partner violence prevention, nutrition, HIV, emergency preparedness in a public health context and so many other fields. So really that's the beauty of our field. You can go in so many different directions and you can use those transferable skills to carry you into each of your positions. And just in closing, I wanna say the importance of learning a language. We live in a very diverse country, which is a wonderful thing. And if you can learn another language, it really helps you connect with some of our priority populations and helps build bridges to those communities. And finally, just in closing, just be bold, go for it, pursue your dreams and um, be fearless. So thank you so much. And I hope we have a couple minutes for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justine and all our panelists. Um, you've shared some amazing stories with us. Um, we have a lot of audience questions and we certainly won't be able to get around to all of them. We're theoretically at time, although some of the panelists have graciously agreed to stay on for a few minutes. Um, so um, we'll try to answer a couple questions. And then again, I suggest that um, if you have very specific questions, please follow up with individuals. Um, many of your questions also, as I'm looking at them, uh, you, you can find answers for on school websites. Uh, ASPPH, there are um, web resources for some very specific questions I see there. Um, so maybe just quickly, broadly, for the panel, um, uh, and, and I, whoever wants to answer, I, I, there are a couple of kind of career-related questions around trajectory. So one, for example, is, well, I got my MPH, and then I noticed that all of the job opportunities out there say you need experience uh, to apply. So what do I do? And, uh, and that kind of flavor, at least for that question. So I'm wondering if anybody would like to take that one on. This is Justine, I'm happy to answer that question. I think that, um, and I mentioned it briefly in my slide, the importance of while you're getting your MPH, you know, if you can intern, or um, look at community coalitions that are focused on topics that interest you and go to those coalitions. And you can do that after you graduate with an MPH as well, but get involved, expand your network. Um, we talked about informational interviews. If there's people working in positions that interest you, reach out to them, ask them to have a cup of coffee or for a Zoom interview and just put your name out there, be bold, connect with others and intern if you can, because internships often lead to positions. I've hired multiple interns that have worked in my office, and I've seen that happen among a lot of colleagues and students I've known. So I think just put yourself out there, connect, and don't be afraid. Thank you. Um, and then a question around what, what you can do with a bachelor's in public health, as opposed to continuing on to the master's, and maybe in a related piece, what kinds of um, extracurriculars or activities should you be engaged in as an undergraduate student to position yourself well for a career in public health? Well, as I, as I uh, commented in my presentation, there's a lot of roles. I think there's increasing roles for people coming out with an undergraduate degree. Um, I think looking in, in areas like um, consulting, health consulting is a place that you can, and, or public health consulting, um, they hire people with undergraduate degrees uh, working for health plans. There are many, like HMOs, there are many roles in within health plans and areas like provider relations and quality improvement, member services, looking in health systems and areas like uh, like quality improvement. Um, there's a lot of roles I've seen for undergrads lately and as a population health analyst, a population health coordinator. Um, so I, I think uh, we're, we're looking at internal consulting within systems like um, like Kaiser Permanente or, or large academic medical centers or getting a research assistant role. So I think the key is that when you're an undergraduate to do internships, as Justine said, as a great way to get your foot in the door in the Health Career Connection internship, 70% of our students get a job offer or extend their internship as your foot in the door in organizations. The second is to be part of health clubs. Um, and to invite speakers from different organizations that you might want to work in to come speak with your club. Um, and then to follow up with them and, and, and network with them and then strategically do projects like Justine said, like class projects can also with organizations can get your foot in the door um, and, go, and go from there. They're also looking at programs um, for um, uh, under fellowship programs for undergraduate students like the CDC Associates program, 
um, is a really good one you could pursue. Thank you. Um, so there are some questions about specific degree options, and I don't know if somebody would like to, I just saw a couple questions around what is the difference between uh, a DRPH and a PhD? I'm not sure if Jeff, that's something you want to uh, address, or actually uh, we've also got, um, uh, no, I'm, I'm seeing uh, some people have stepped off the call, some of the panelists this time. Yeah, so I think Nicole would be good because she has her DRPH, um, but I think that the difference is that uh, a PhD is really a degree for someone who wants to be a, a researcher and a researcher in either a, like a, a peer review, uh, uh, a research in, uh, university uh, and do peer review type academic research or work in a, something like a think tank like a, like a RAND or Booking Institute, something like that. It really teaches you to be, you know, have rigorous um, research skills. Um, whereas a, a DRPH, you also get research skills, but they tend to be more applied um, research skills. And in, there's also tends to be a focus on, on leadership development um, and uh, you know, preparing people to be leaders in different kinds of health institutions um, that have research skills and could also be researchers and teach, but it, it tends to be not as heavy on the, the, the research skill and dissertation um, and more focused on ap application and leadership. Okay, and I have a question that I think this is one for, good one for Lesford, which is how do I uh, get a public health career without uh, it being a desk job, you know, sitting behind a computer <laughs> and, uh, and, and a keyboard? Yeah. Well, come, come to outdoor outreach, I definitely say we, we, get to, we get to balance that. Um, unfortunately, in my role, I, have, I, I still have some desk responsibilities. Um, but being able to, to get out into, into community um, has been my greatest joy. And um, I mean, truly, when, when I say that public health is so interdisciplinary and public health skill sets um, are now being asked of so many other sectors, even outside of kind of the traditional health sector, um, your degree will help you to think broader about systems and how systems in, uh, impact the health and the well-being of, of youth. So, uh, you know, just as a brief example, through our leadership program, so many of our youth then connect or they, they learn advocacy skills. They learn how to, how to leverage their voice and their passion um, and their story to be able to affect change both here on a local city level as well as on a statewide level. So, in, in doing that work, we're affecting change because those youth are now going to Sacramento and demanding outdoor access for youth that are coming from inner city communities. They're demanding uh, the development of parks in their, in their areas. And that is ultimately gonna affect the health and the well-being of communities. So I say all that to say, think broadly about your career and think, think about how systems impact the health of individuals um, and you'll be able to create a public health career just uh, 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 that, that, that really um, meets what sets your soul on fire. Thank you. So I really wanna thank all of our panelists for, for your time and all of the attendees um, for your thoughtful questions. Um, again, the recording of this webinar will be available soon on the ASPPH website. Uh, and as you close out of the session, please take a moment to complete a very brief session survey. Uh, Zoom will display it on your web browser. Uh, and again, please follow up with questions. I know there are many, many, and we simply couldn't get around to, to addressing every single one. Lots of very interesting questions. Uh, so thank you again. Uh, this concludes our webinar today. Thank you all for joining. And uh, there are a number of upcoming events you can see uh, listed here. Uh, you can go to the website uh, down below to access and uh, Thank you again. Take care.